Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023. The House votes to remove Republican Congressman Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House, passing a resolution to vacate the Speaker's chair offered by Republican Congressman Matt Gates. First time this has happened in U.S. history. In the Senate, the newly appointed senator from California, Democrat LaFonza Butler, is sworn in, filling the seat left vacant by the death of Democrat Dianne Feinstein. Congressman Henry Cuellar, Democrat of Texas, talks about being carjacked last night in Washington, D.C. by three armed attackers. He was not hurt. His car was recovered. And the Supreme Court hears a case that challenges the very existence of the government agency known as the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The plaintiffs contend that agency's funding mechanism, as created by Congress, violates the U.S. Constitution's Appropriations Clause. From Associated Press, Speaker Kevin McCarthy was voted out of a job Tuesday in an extraordinary showdown, a first in U.S. history. The 216 to 210 vote, forced by a contingent of hard right conservatives, throws the House and its Republican leadership into chaos. Speaker McCarthy's chief rival, Congressman Matt Gates of Florida, brought forward the motion to vacate, drawing together more than a handful of conservative Republican critics of the Speaker and many Democrats who say he is unworthy of leadership. Next steps are uncertain, but there's no obvious successor to lead the House Republican majority. That from Associated Press. Here's the vote being called by the congressman in the chair, Steve Womack, Republican from Arkansas. On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 210. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. And there were eight Republicans who joined the Democrats in voting to remove Speaker McCarthy. Ken Buck of Colorado, Tim Burchett of Tennessee, Eli Crane of Arizona, Matt Gates of Florida, Bob Good of Virginia, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendale of Montana. And right after the vote was called, Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, took the chairman's spot presiding over the House to announce that he is on a list that, it, that makes him the temporary speaker. House will come to order. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir, this is to notify you that the first name on the letter received by the clerk pursuant to Clause 8B, 3B of Rule 1 is the Honorable Patrick T. McHenry of North Carolina. Signed sincerely, Kevin F. McCumber, Acting Clerk. Pursuant to Clause 8B3 of Rule 1, I will now, now act as Speaker Pro Tem. The Chair will inform the members of the House the following. The Office of the Speaker was rendered vacant pursuant to the adoption of House Resolution 757. Upon a vacancy in the Office of Speaker, Clause 8B3 of Rule 1 provides that the next member on a list submitted by the Speaker pursuant to the rule acts as Speaker Pro Tem until the election of a new Speaker and bestows the authorities of the Office of Speaker upon the Speaker Pro Tem to the extent necessary and appropriate to that end. In the opinion of the Chair, prior to proceeding to the election of a Speaker, it would be prudent to first recess for the relative caucus and conferences to meet and discuss the path forward. Accordingly, pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess subject to the call of the Chair. Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, now the temporary Speaker, as the House has voted to oust Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Republican from California. Again, the vote was 216 to 210. Democrats voting no, joined by eight Republicans, and that was enough to remove the speaker. Here is some of the debate before the vote. Congressman Tom Cole, Republican from Oklahoma, defending the speaker. You know, I think broadly speaking, as I look across this floor, you can divide members into three groups. I'm very happy to be in the first group. The overwhelming majority of my party 
supports the Speaker that we elected. We're proud of the leadership he's shown. We're proud of the manner in which he's been willing to work with everybody in our conference and, I believe, in this chamber. There's a second group, small group. Uh, honestly, uh, they're willing to, ca to plunge this body into chaos and this country into uncertainty for reasons that only they really understand. I certainly don't. And then there are friends on my, the other side. I mean friends, honestly, uh, with great sincerity. I have a lot of friends over there. And I recognize that my friends on the other side have a very complex set of partisan, personal, and uh, political calculations to make. And I certainly wouldn't presume to give them any advice about that. But I would say, think long and hard before you plunge us into chaos, because that's where we're headed if we vacate the speakership. You know, I personally think there's really three reasons why we've come to this point. And that's because at each three of these critical minutes, the speaker did the right thing. First, there was a speaker vote. You know, he got 85 percent of the vote in our conference, 90 percent of the vote from Republicans on this floor. Yet we had a small group that decided, no, they would dictate what they want. He didn't let that happen. He fought. Now, he fought for himself, but he fought for 90 percent of us, too, that wanted him to be the speaker. And I appreciate that. Then, of course, we had the debt ceiling deal. Nobody here thought he could pass a bill. Nobody in America thought he could pass the bill. He did what speakers are supposed to do. He passed the bill. Then he sat down and negotiated with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president and came back with a good deal, a deal that will limit spending. He did the right thing. Finally, last Saturday on this floor, we were on the verge of a government shutdown, a government shutdown that the vast majority of members in this chamber did not want a substantial majority on my side, an overwhelming majority on the Democrat side. He put his political neck on the line, knowing this day was coming, to do the right thing, the right thing for the country, without a doubt. My friends and I agree on that, whether or not we agree on the speaker. He did the right thing. He did the right thing, I think, for this institution. He showed it could function in a time of crisis. And finally, I think he did the right thing for our party. He made sure that we could continue to negotiate and achieve some of the very objectives my friend uh, from Virginia laid out, and achieve them in divided government, which calls for some degree of give and take. So I'm very proud of this speaker. I'm very proud to stand behind him. Tomorrow morning, whether I win or lose, I'm going to be pretty proud of the people I fought with, and I'm going to be extraordinarily proud of the person I fought for, the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Amen. Congressman Tom Cole, Republican from Oklahoma, on the floor before the House voted to remove Kevin McCarthy as Speaker. And that privileged resolution was sponsored by another Republican, Matt Gates of Florida. Mr. Speaker, my friend from Oklahoma says that my colleagues and I who don't support Kevin McCarthy would plunge the House and the country into chaos. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. The one thing that the White House, House Democrats, and many of us on the conservative side of the Republican caucus would argue is that the thing we have in common, Kevin McCarthy said something to all of us at one point or another that he didn't really mean and never intended to live up to. I don't think voting against Kevin McCarthy is chaos. I think $33 trillion in debt is chaos. I think that facing a $2.2 trillion annual deficit is chaos. I think that not passing single subject spending bills is chaos. I think the fact that we have been governed in this country since the mid 90s by continuing resolution and omnibus is chaos. And the way to liberate ourselves from that is a series of reforms to this body that I would hope would outlast Speaker McCarthy's time here would outlast my time here and would outlast either of our majorities. Reforms that I have heard some of the most conservative members of this body f uh, fight for and some of the reforms that we've been battling for that I've even heard those in the Democrat caucus say would be worthy and helpful to the House, like open amendments, like understanding what the budget is. We have been out of compliance with budget laws for most of my life, most of many of your lives. And by the way, if we did those things, 
If we had single subject bills, if we had an understanding on the top line, if we had open amendments, if we had trust and honesty and understanding, there would be times when my conservative colleagues and I would lose. Might be a few times when we'd win. There'd be times that we would form partnerships that might otherwise not be uh, really predictable in the American body politic, but the American people would see us legislating. These last few days, we've suspended the momentum that we had established the week earlier, where we were bringing bills to the floor, voting on them, staying late at night, working hard. That's what the American people expect. It's something Speaker McCarthy hasn't delivered, and that's why I've moved to vacate the chair. Congressman Matt Gates, Republican from Florida, on the House floor before the vote successful on his privilege resolution to remove Congressman Kevin McCarthy from the speakership. NBC News reports that Congressman Gates spoke to a large group of reporters on the steps outside the Capitol after and said, turns out getting 200 Republicans to trust you isn't enough to stay speaker. NBC News also reports that Speaker McCarthy remained on the House floor after the vote, shaking hands with members and exchanging hugs. More from the debate today. And here is Congressman Tom McClintock, Republican from California, who warned that if Speaker McCarthy were removed, the future is uncertain. If there was ever a time for sobriety, wisdom, and caution in this House, it is right now. If this motion carries, the, the House will be paralyzed. We can expect week after week of fruitless ballots while no other business can be conducted. The Democrats will revel in Republican dysfunction, and the public will rightly be repulsed. It'll end when the Democrats are able to enlist a rump caucus of Republicans to join a coalition to end the impasse. This House will shift dramatically to the left and will effectively end Republican House majority that the voters elected in 2022. And this, in turn, will neutralize the only counterweight in our elected government to the woke left's control of the Senate and the White House at a time when their policies are destroying our economy and have opened our borders to invasion. There are turning points in history whose significance is only realized by the events that they unleash. This is one of those times. We are at the precipice. There are only minutes left to come to our senses and realize the grave danger our country is in at this moment. Dear God, grant us the wisdom to see it and to save our country from it. Congressman Tom McClintock, Republican from California, on the House floor. And the House did vote to remove Speaker McCarthy. New York Times reporting that during this roll call vote, and it was done with the clerk of the House calling each member's name individually, that person standing and saying yay or nay. New York Times reporting that much like during the fight to be elected Speaker, Speaker McCarthy sat through this roll call vote to oust him, projecting optimism and occasionally whispering to an aide beside him. His optimistic disposition has not wavered during his tumultuous speakership one that could be over in a matter of minutes. That was the Times during the vote, and the vote was successful for the sponsor of the resolution, Congressman Gates, to remove the Speaker. One of the Republicans who voted to remove him as well, Bob Good of Virginia, spoke. The Speaker fought through 15 votes in January to become Speaker, but was only willing to fight through one failed CR before surrendering to the Democrats on Saturday. We need a Speaker who will fight for something anything besides just staying or becoming Speaker. If there was ever a time to fight, with $33 trillion in national debt, a $2 trillion deficit this year, 40-year high inflation, 20-year high interest rates, a downgraded credit rating, and for the first time in modern history, the polls showing, despite all the help of the media blaming Republicans in the House, the polls showed that the public was blaming Biden and the Democrats for an imminent shutdown. If not fight now, when would we fight? Now is and was the time. With the Democrats driving the fiscal bus off the cliff at 100 miles an hour, we cannot simply be content to be the party that slows it down to 95 just so we can sit in the front seat and wear the captain's hat. Our current debt and our spending trajectory is unsustainable. We need a speaker, ideally somebody who doesn't want to be speaker and hasn't pursued that at all costs for his entire adult life, 
who will meet the moment and do everything possible to fight for the country. A red line was crossed for me, I regret, on Saturday, and chose regret that I must vote against the motion to table as I did and to vote to vacate the chair. Congressman Bob Good, Republican from Virginia, on the House floor before the House voted 216 to 210 on a motion that did vacate the Speaker's chair, removing Speaker Kevin McCarthy from that position. And there were eight Republicans who voted with the Democrats. Besides Bob Good and the sponsor, Matt Gates, there was Ken Buck of Colorado, Tim Burchett of Tennessee, Eli Crane of Arizona, Nancy Mays of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendale from Montana. Earlier in the day, the Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries from New York, sent out a Dear Colleague letter to his Democratic colleagues announcing that he would recommend that they also vote to oust the Speaker. He spoke with reporters outside a Democratic caucus members' meeting. Word. This is a serious, solemn, and sober moment. House Democrats are going to continue to put people over politics and to fight to make life better for everyday Americans. From the very beginning, that has been our objective, and it will continue to be our sole focus, delivering for the American people. We encourage our Republican colleagues who claim to be more traditional to break from the extremists in the chaos, in the dysfunction, in the extremism, we are ready, willing, and able to work together with our Republican colleagues, but it is on them to join us to move the Congress and the country forward. Thank you. Is Kevin McCarthy going to be the speaker after today? That was Congressman Akeem Jeffries, the minority leader, Democrat from New York, with reporters this morning before he sent out a letter to his Democratic colleagues recommending they vote to oust Speaker Kevin McCarthy removed him from office, and they did, and enough Republicans also did. That Speaker McCarthy has now been removed. Also speaking with reporters about this outside the Democratic Caucus meeting, Pramila Jayapal of Washington State. She chairs the Progressive Caucus. Congresswoman, is there a world in which you see the, conf- the caucus that just met in there voting to help Speaker McCarthy? I think we had a really great caucus meeting. It was extremely unified. We're standing behind our leader, Hakeem Jeffries. He is the person that should be Speaker of the House, and there is reason after reason to uh, to just let Republicans deal with their with their own problems. I mean, they can let them wallow in their pigsty of incompetence and inability to govern. They are they are destroying our institution. But what does I think that mean? Does that mean voting impact. present? Like, how is this going to play out? We are we are not voting in any way that would help save Speaker McCarthy. So either present or voting this against him. This does impact Democrats in a sense, right? I mean, you guys are trying to fund the government. You're trying to pass the farm bill. You're this trying to pass a democratic the- problem. As much as anybody out here might want to make it a democratic problem, this is not a democratic problem. This is a Republican problem. They supposedly have the majority. They should be able to pick their own speaker. Our speaker is Hakeem Jeffries. It always has been. It, w- it was for 15 rounds. It will continue to be. So does is that the mean? I'm here that just nobody before? trusts Kevin McCarthy. Nobody trusts Kevin McCarthy. Nobody trusts Kevin McCarthy, and why should we? He has broken his commitment over and over again. And it's not just the deal with President Biden. It's not just the Ukraine funding, which apparently was also a deal, but then it wasn't a deal on, you know, unless we secure the border. It's also going back to January 6th. And I think for a lot of us, we, we were here. It is still deeply emotional for us because it is about our country. It's about why we came to Congress. And Kevin McCarthy stood on the House floor and said one thing and then talked to Donald Trump and immediately did something else. He has supported the insurrectionist president that enabled January 6th to happen and tried to obstruct the peaceful transfer of power. So there are a lot of reasons to not trust Kevin McCarthy. You could probably go back before January 6th, but certainly January 6th, uh, was was a, a really key example, and the most recent history of how he's governed as Speaker is another example. The first vote will likely be like a motion to table or refer. So will Democrats vote uh, no, will unanimously vote no on that? We are following our leader, and we are not saving Kevin McCarthy. 
Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, this morning outside the closed meeting of the House Democrats. And later on, that motion to table the privilege resolution to remove the speaker did fail. And then the motion to vacate the actual resolution did pass, and Democrats did vote to remove the speaker. North Carolina Newsline puts it this way. Dissident Republicans in the U.S. House voted with Democrats on Tuesday to oust Kevin McCarthy as Speaker, a historic move that came just nine months after he secured the gavel following days of negotiating with the GOP's right flank and 15 rounds of voting. It wasn't immediately clear after the vote how the House would proceed in the coming days. Having entered uncharted territory, no Speaker has ever been removed by the House. North Carolina Congressman Patrick McHenry was named Speaker Pro Tem until the election of a new Speaker. And the vote was 216 to 210. Again, the Republicans who voted to remove the Speaker, Andy Biggs of Arizona, Ken Buck of Colorado, Tim Burchett of Tennessee, Eli Crane of Arizona, Matt Gates of Florida, Bob Good of Virginia, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendale from Montana. This is Washington Today. Vice President Kamala Harris is president of the U.S. Senate and today swore in LaFonza Butler as California's newest senator. California Governor Gavin Newsom chose LaFonza Butler, a Democrat, to fill the seat of the late Senator Dianne Feinstein, also a Democrat. The chair lays before the Senate a certificate of appointment to fill the unexpected, unexpired, and unexpected, uh, term created by the death of the late Senator Dianne Feinstein of the state of California. The certificate, the chair is advised, is in the form suggested by the Senate. Hearing no objection, the reading of the certificate will be waived and it will be printed in full in the record. If the senator designate will now present herself at the desk, the chair will administer the oath of office. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Or say, do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which you are about to enter, so help you God. I will. Congratulations. 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 On the Senate floor today, the swearing in of the newest senator, Senator LaFonza Butler, Democrat from California, by Vice President Kamala Harris, who is also President of the Senate under the Constitution. And now the Democrats again have a 51 to 49 majority in the Senate. After the swearing in, Senate leaders welcomed her, starting with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York. It says, let me be the first to welcome our newest colleague, but I see she's had a lot of good welcomes already. So let me be the first majority leader to welcome our newest colleague to the United States Senate. Senator LaFonza Butler, sworn in moments ago as the next senator from California. Mr. President, I can't help but think how proud Senator Feinstein would be seeing someone as brilliant, as accomplished, as history-making as LaFonza Butler take her place. I know that our old colleague is looking down at this moment with pride now that her seat is in good hands. Congratulations to Senator Butler on this immense honor. This is a historic moment for the Senate, for California, and for the entire country. Senator Butler is only the third black woman in American history to serve in the United States Senate. She's the first openly lesbian senator from California. And she's the first openly LGBTQ senator of color to serve in this body. Today, the Senate, today the Senate takes another step towards fully reflecting our vibrant democracy. Now, LaFonza's life story can be summarized in two words, serving others. By her own telling, service was practically a dinner table conversation growing up in Magnolia, Mississippi. After losing her father to illness, LaFonza watched her mom sacrifice everything to put her kids first. 
working night shifts as a nurse, as a security guard, a classroom aide, anything to help her kids have a better life. No surprise, that example left a mark on Lafonza for the rest of her days. Following in her mom's footsteps, Lafonza has dedicated her entire career to fighting for others, fighting for women, fighting for working families, and fighting for the cause of justice. I know she'll do the same here in the Senate. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York. He mentioned that Senator Butler is the third black woman to serve as a senator. The other two are now Vice President Kamala Harris, who was a senator from California, and former Senator Carol Mosley Braun, Democrat from Illinois. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell also greeted the new senator. I'd like to begin today by welcoming our newest colleague, Senator LaFonza Butler of California. As the Senate continues to mourn our late friend and colleague, Diane Feinstein, I know the people of California are grateful for Senator Butler's willingness to serve, and I know our colleagues join me in welcoming, welcoming her. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky. The L.A. Times reports that Senator Butler said she is unsure if she'll join the field of Democrats running for this Senate seat in 2024. Senator Feinstein said before she passed away that she would not be running for re-election, so it's an open seat. And this from Roll Call, the Senate will adjourn earlier than planned this week with no session on Thursday to allow members to travel to California and pay their respects to the late Senator Dianne Feinstein. Diane Feinstein will lie in state at San Francisco City Hall on Wednesday, reflecting her deep connection to the city. That will be followed by a funeral service on Thursday at the San Francisco War Memorial and Performing Arts Center in the Herbst Theater. The funeral will be closed to the public, but televised online and simulcast at City Hall. The late senator will be buried at a family-only ceremony thereafter. That from Roll Call. This is Washington Today. Congressman Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Texas, spoke today about being carjacked Monday night by armed attackers in Washington, D.C.'s Navy Yard area, about a mile from the U.S. Capitol. A moment about what happened yesterday? Sure. Explain to us. Uh, yeah, I got to go somewhere. This is the pool camera, so this is... Uh, just maybe 30 seconds, if that's Yeah, okay. 30 what, seconds, can yeah. You, can you tell us what happened and, and how you found out? Yeah, I was just uh, coming into my place, uh, three guys, uh, came out of uh, nowhere and they pointed guns uh, at me. I do have a black belt, but I uh, recognize when you got three, uh, three guns, uh, I looked at one with a gun, another one with a gun, a third one behind me. Uh, so they said they wanted my car. I said, sure, you gotta keep calm in those situations. And then they took off. They uh, recovered the car, they recovered everything. What really got me upset was they took my sushi. But anyway, that's something else. Uh, and they did recover the sushi after all. But anyway, uh, they, uh, I do want to thank the uh, Capitol Police, and I certainly want to thank the uh, Metro Police. Uh, I'm a big law enforcement person. I got three brothers in law enforcement, so I certainly appreciate the, uh, the good work that the police did last night. Everything was recovered, my phone, uh, my um, uh, car, and everything. Three guns pointed at you? Yes. How is this affecting you emotionally? I, I'm good. I'm good. I, I uh, like I said, you got to keep calm under those situations, and uh, you analyze the situation quickly. You look around. One gun, second gun, maybe a third one behind me. You got to st stay calm. They wanted the car. Sure, we tracked the car, uh, the phone, the car, everything, and uh, within uh, I don't know less than two hours, they got everything back. Do you think you were? Do you think you were a target because you're a member? No. Well, now, look, I, I, they, they had masks. They had masks, but you could still see that they were young. Uh, they had young folks. You don't think they knew who you were? Uh, no, I don't think so. This, this, this guys were three. Uh, yeah, you got to support. Message is very simple. You got to support law enforcement. And, I, and I've been doing that for a long time. Three brothers are peace officers. There should be a boost to member security. Uh, yeah, it, I, I don't know. I would leave that to House administration. But uh, this happened less than a mile away from the capital and my, my place uh, you got uh, uh, our leader Hakeem there Catherine Clark that lives there a whole bunch of members that live in that place so so I'll, I'll leave that up to the uh, police but Thank on you. that Congressman Henry Cuellar Democrat from Texas speaking with reporters this morning in the U.S. Capitol building also stopping by a different place where the reporters were gathering Republican Congressman Brian Stile of Wisconsin, who chairs the House Administration Committee, and asked about the carjacking of Congressman Cuellar and 
safety of members of Congress and their staff. We just held a briefing for uh, staff a couple of weeks ago about trying to stay safe in D.C. We, <laughs> we had, did. We had this issue with Mr. Cuellar. Absolutely. Are the Metropolitan Police, and for that matter, U.S. Capitol Police, because so many members live over in the Navy Yard, are they not, should that, should that jurisdiction be expanded? What can be done to make this a little safer? Well, the U.S. Capitol Police's jurisdiction extends beyond just the federal government property here on Capitol Hill. The reason we held um, that hearing um, a couple days ago uh, was because crime is spiking in Washington, D.C., as it is uh, in blue cities across the country. Uh, we've heard from countless members, uh, or countless individuals who work on Capitol Hill, in particular staff, uh, visitors from my home state of Wisconsin and other places, uh, as well as members uh, that don't feel safe in Washington, D.C. That's a huge problem. Uh, is why we gave uh, people that work here, members, staff, visitors, uh, tips on how to stay safe in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I think the incident last night is an example of what happens uh, in cities uh, that are run by Democrats where crime is rising. Just this year in Washington, D.C., over 5,000 vehicles have been stolen. That averages 20 to 25 cars a day stolen in our nation's capital. There's been over 700 carjackings, uh, and it is incredibly uh, frustrating that actions are not being taken in Washington, D.C. I, I guess what I'm asking, though, is, Go ahead. is that obviously, I know that their jurisdiction goes out a little bit yes. here, but you have so many staff who live at Navy Yard, yes. so many members who live at Navy Yard. Yep. Is there a different approach now, despite the briefing the other day, that say, okay, look, we need to, you know, kind of like what the Capitol yeah. Police did a few years ago, yep. where they started to work with local police and with members in the district. Is that a special case because of Navy Yard and so much of this has gone down uh, in Navy Yard? I think that's worthy of the conversation. I mean, not only was there the, the carjacking of uh, the congressman last night, there was a shooting, um, a, a significant shooting over the weekend um, on M Street. Um, down in Navy Yard as well, and so I think that that's something that's completely worthy of us considering. Right, right, right. I mean, should it have gotten to this point, though? I mean, there was a staffer for um, a, a congressman who was attacked after the congressional baseball. Right. Which is right there as well. That was in July. Or yeah, no, in, 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 incredibly concerning. It's why, it's why many of us have been pushing for Washington, D.C. Uh, to address the rising crime that's been occurring here. Um, if you look at the, the House Republican Conference, we put forward a bill uh, that overrode uh, the D.C. City Council that had soft on crime policies. The president said he was going to veto it. The problem is so bad, the president, in the end, had to sign our legislation uh, to overturn that law. And so we've been working to make this city safe, but it's soft on crime policies uh, that are really running rampant, and, and people who live here, visit here, work here, are paying the price for that. Congressman Brian Stile, Republican from Wisconsin, chair of the House Administration Committee, meeting with reporters from Associated Press, Monday's carjacking of Congressman Cuellar was the second assault on a member of Congress in the District of Columbia this year. In February, Democratic Congresswoman Angie Craig of Minnesota was assaulted in her apartment building, suffering bruises while escaping serious injury. Her chief of staff said the attack did not appear to be politically motivated. Washington Today continues in a moment. When citizens are truly informed, our republic thrives. Get informed straight from the source on C-SPAN. Unfiltered, unbiased, word for word. From the nation's capital to wherever you are. Because the opinion that matters the most is your own. This is what democracy looks like. C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, which you can get as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. A few more headlines from Politico. President Joe Biden convened a call with world leaders Tuesday, the White House said, in an effort to reassure allies about U.S. support for Ukraine after Congress passed a short-term government funding bill that did not include aid for the warring country. Hunter Biden, son of Joe Biden, pleaded not guilty in federal court in Wilmington, Delaware, to falsifying a federal firearms application, lying to a federally licensed gun dealer, and possessing an illegally obtained gun. This happened in 2018. He's charged with not telling the truth about his illegal drug use at the time. The New York Times writes this is the latest development in an investigation that Republicans have tried to use to inflict political damage on his father. And from CNN about the civil fraud trial against former President Donald Trump and his company, Judge Arthur Engeron rebuked Donald Trump after the former president attacked his clerk in a social media post on Tuesday and forbade the parties from making any future comments about his staff. Donald Trump posted on Truth Social, attacking Judge Engeron's clerk, claiming she was a girlfriend to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and showing a picture of the two of them together. 
The judge said, personal attacks of any member of my court staff are unacceptable, inappropriate, and I will not tolerate them. ABC News previewing today's Supreme Court oral argument writes the government agency created after the 2008 financial crisis to protect Americans from predatory and deceptive business practices is on the line at the Supreme Court. The justices will hear an existential challenge to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the independent watchdog and banking regulator, in a case that could impact anyone who has a mortgage, loan, or credit card. A group of payday loan companies regulated by CFPB allege that the way the agency is funded, not by annual appropriations from Congress, but by the Federal Reserve, is unconstitutional. They want the court to invalidate everything the CFPB has done since its inception because of the allegedly illegal arrangement. Here's part of today's oral argument. Justice Samuel Alito questioning U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogger. Could Congress pass the same law with no upper limit, allowing the executive branch to determine however much it wished to take. So we don't think that Congress would have to provide a a statutory specified amount, but they would, of course, have to specify the purpose of the funding. Okay, but but just on the amount, your theory doesn't turn on there being an upper limit. Our theory doesn't turn on it because of the the wealth of historical evidence. So the president could take a trillion dollars if he wished to do so. No, because I think that Congress itself has specified that the director is limited to the amount that's reasonably necessary to carry out federal consumer financial law. If the president determined it was reasonably necessary to take a trillion dollars, that would satisfy your concern. And on the appropriations clause itself has no upper limit constraint. I I think that that would violate the statute, and the same theoretical possibility exists with all of the other financial regulators I've been discussing. But if you disagree, Justice Gorsuch, of course, here we have nothing like that. I'm just trying to understand your theory. That's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, so our theory is rooted in history. Congress has appropriated in this way without a cap for time immemorial from 1789 on. How about on on the lower end of the scale? What if the president decided zero was the appropriate sum? Uh, I'm not going to take any money. I don't like the CFPB, you know. I don't think it's reasonably necessary to take another dollar. Could the president do that? So I think that would violate the statute as well at that point. I'm talking about the appropriations clause. So I, so I think that, you know, Congress itself has specified the purpose. And so I think that if the president or the CFPB director didn't comply with the statute, that would be a violation. And I would expect Congress to step in and change the funding mechanism. But all of these theoretical possibilities exist with respect to countless other appropriations. All of the other financial regulators, for example, I, I, likewise. I, I, understand, I understand the practical realities, and I appreciate them, and I understand the statutory arguments. I'm just trying to understand the appropriations clause theory. Is there anything that would prohibit the president in the appropriations clause from deciding whether to take zero dollars, and we've already established he could take a trillion? I don't think the appropriations clause would be a check there, although, of course, Congress could then exercise its authority and its power over the purse to change the discretion that's provided to require the president or the director of the agency to take a particular amount. The U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogger questioned by Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. Oral argument in today's case, CFPB, the Community Financial Services Association. The attorney representing the association, Noel Francisco, got these questions from Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. At a bare minimum, the Appropriations Clause requires Congress to determine how much the government should be spending. That's the core element of an appropriation. That's why I think everybody agrees that Congress can't simply say to the President, spend whatever you want. But but, but this is functionally no different when you're saying to an agency, spend whatever you want in perpetuity as long as you don't exceed a number so high, it's almost never relevant. I think that's why this unique constellation of factors is so uniquely problematic. But Mr. Francisco, I'm sorry, where do you get that from? So you said the definition is what now? Uh, I think the core element of an appropriation is that Congress has to, at a minimum, determine the amount that the government should be spending. A it fixed cannot, amount? It uh, can't do it by a cap? It has to be a fixed amount? You're, yes, Your Honor. I think it has to set the amount that it should be spending. It can leave some play in the joints, as it did in the founding era, sums not exceeding statutes. Remember, those were annual appropriations. Okay, so which, where, where do you get that from? Your Honor, I, mean, what, I think that, what? so I get it from, I think, the text of the Appropriations Clause. I think that's the core element of an appropriation, but I also do think I'm sorry, the to, word appropriation, like what, what in the text of the Appropriations sure. Clause makes it so that the requirement so, is that the government can only mm-hmm. 
uh, or the government has to uh, fix the amount? Three things, Your Honor. Yes. The first is I think that it is inherent in what an appropriation is. It's got to be the authorization, authorization to spend an amount of money. Secondly, any spending has to but be... But wait, where's the fixed amount part of that? Sure, Your Honor, and that's yeah. what I'm getting okay. to. Secondly, any spending has to be in consequence of uh, an appropriation. So it's got to be in consequence of Congress's judgment. If you simply delegate to the executive the authority to make that frontline determination, the spending isn't in consequence of Congress's determination. And the third does turn uh, to history and purpose. The whole point of separating the sword from the purse is to protect individual liberty. If you allow Congress to essentially transfer its authority to pick the appropriation to but the it's, executive branch. But it's not a transfer itself. if, so what if I defined appropriation differently, all right? What if, what if an appropriation is just the decision that you are going to, uh, you know, that, that a particular government department can spend up to a certain amount of money, that they have the ability to use a certain amount of the public fisc. What if that's my starting definition? Well, Your Honor, if that's you your lose? starting definition, then I think you've adopted a definition of appropriation that does, in fact, allow Congress to essentially let the president pick his own appropriation. And but if, if that's the that, definition in the Constitution, then I'm not allowing anything. That's what the Constitution well, says. Yeah, if you think that the Constitution allows Congress to essentially say to the executive, you pick the number, spend whatever you want forever, I, I, I would agree. I would lose this case. Noel Francisco is an attorney for Community Financial Services Association of America in the case CFPB v. The Association, questioned by Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson in today's oral argument. It's the second day of the new Supreme Court term. From a Forbes article as this, if the Supreme Court rules CFPB's funding structure is unconstitutional and issues a broad ruling that defunds the agency and revokes its powers as a result, it could have wide-reaching economic consequences Groups have warned in amicus briefs filed with the court, including groups representing mortgage bankers, home builders, and realtors. The United States Postal Service on Monday released a postage stamp honoring the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, saying the stamp celebrates her groundbreaking contributions to justice, gender equality, and the rule of law. Justice Ginsburg died in 2020 at the age of 87. The forever stamp, which currently costs 66 cents, shows an oil painting of Justice Ginsburg in a black judicial robe with the the white collar that became her trademark. National Public Radio legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg spoke at the ceremony about Justice Ginsburg's career, but also her personal side. Over her 87 years, she was a friend to hundreds and hundreds of people from all walks of life. The Supreme Court IT guy charged with teaching her how to use a computer found that from time to time, the justice who knew he was an opera fan would invite him to go to a performance with her. Or there was the law clerk, who had no idea that the justice knew of his trouble finding a daycare spot for his toddler, until the day he accompanied her to a speech at Georgetown University. And afterwards, in the elevator, RBG asked her escorts, where is the daycare center? The answer was the basement where RBG promptly led the whole entourage, announcing when she got there, hello, I'm Justice Ginsburg. My clerk, Joe, is looking for a daycare spot for his son, Simon. We'd like a tour. <laughs> Problem solved. I could never get over how much emotional peripheral vision Ruth had. She always seemed to know when to write, when to call, and her actions were so often above and beyond the call of duty. When cancer reared its ugly head again in 2018, she leaned on my surgeon husband, David, for advice, but I remained in the dark. On the day of the surgery, just hours after she was wheeled out of the OR, she called me from the ICU. She was calling, she said, because she wanted me to know why she had forbidden David to tell me anything about what was going on. I didn't want you to be trapped between your friendship for me and your obligations as a journalist, she said. NPR legal affairs correspondent Nina Totenberg, Monday night at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, the unveiling of the new 
Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg postage stamp. Wall Street today, the Dow down 430, S&P down 58, NASDAQ down 248. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word and get the stories making headlines in Washington emailed to you every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. 